I welcome you again for this NPTEL online course on Earthquake Geotechnical Engineering. And today we are going to talk the last lecture on this uh, module 3 which is on ground response analysis and local site effects. We are under chapter 3rd of this uh, module which is on local site effects and this is the 4th lecture on, on the local site effects. What we are going to talk in this lectures are listed here. Uh, we are going to talk development of ground motion time trees and this development of ground motion time trees, these time trees are used for the design of the structures, for the analysis of the structures. So, this can be done in four ways. One is modification of actual ground motion records that whatever the records is available from uh, the, uh, uh, the seismograph or the axillograph from the instrumentation, you modify that. Then the second could be time domain generation for these ground motion time histories. Then third frequency domain gen generation and the fourth one is Green's function technique. And finally, we are going to talk about the what are the certain limitations of artificial ground motions. So, let us have first development of ground motion time histories and the starting from motion of actual ground motion records. And most of the stuff is taken from the Kramer's book for this. In fact, for the local site effects, all like you know most of the information is coming from this source. So, development of ground motion time histories, on many occasions this ground motion parameters alone will not be sufficient that we find p ground acceleration or let us say it uh, uh, predominant frequency or maybe duration. So, like for a strong ground motion they, they can simplify your problem but that itself may not be enough and we require what we call the actual time history. For analysis of nonlinear problems such as the response of inelastic structures or the permanent deformation of an unstable slope, time histories of motions are required. And time history can also be required in the development of what we call the scientific design ground motion and which is like uh, how development of scientific design ground motions uh, is done. It is in this case, we, uh, we discuss uh, development of site specific uh, design ground motion in the last lecture also. But the easiest way of doing it is just uh, whatever the like is for example, there are two figure A and B in this slide. In the figure A, you have the original exogram from actual earthquake which is recorded. So, in the figure B, you what you are doing, you are scaling it, all the peaks are scaled by a factor of 1.5. So, if you compare this double ordinate or let us say this value from here to here with this value. So, in the second case it is 1.5 times of the in the first case the values like difference between the values here. And not only the peak values but other peaks are also multiplied by a factor 1.5. So, you could see that even this was diminished here almost 0 but still you, you could visible here. So, the peak are but there is no change in the frequency content or let us say with the time duration only the peak value have been. So, this is the normally done when you want to have the target spectrum is like uh, you have uh, scaled up. So, here it is most of the time it is scaled up. So, for the in continue with this in some cases time histories that match target ground motion parameters and what are the ground motion parameters? It is such as a peak acceleration or peak velocities or spe spectral ordinates are required. In some, some cases, the local and regional geologic and tectonic conditions of the site of interest may be similar to those of the sites where actual strong ground motion have been recorded or measured. In that case, you no need to modify those strong uh, ground motion can be used directly. No modification is required. Suppose your the site have the same characteristics as the characteristic where this uh, the motion has been recorded, but this is not the normally this is not the case. Usually this is not the case and in that case artificial ground motions must be developed which mean can be done in a different number of ways. Now, the main challenges in their development are to be ensured that they are consistent with the target parameters and they are realistic. These motions should be realistic. When we say the realistic, that means that their characteristics are consistent with those of actual earthquakes. So, whatever you develop the ground motion 
and their characteristics should be similar to the actual earthquakes. Now, for development of ground motion time histories, as we discussed earlier also, there are different methods. The most commonly used methods for the generation of artificial ground motions can, uh, fall into four main categories. First one, modification of actual ground motion records, the whatever the you have the record, the modified that. Then you have generation of artificial motions in the time domain and it could be generation of artificial motion in the frequency domain and generation of artificial motion using Green's function technique. So, we will discuss one by one. So, first one is modification of actual ground motion records. This is the as we discussed earlier too, this is the simplest approach to the generation of artificial ground motion it is the modification of the actual recorded ground motion. So, you have the actual recorded ground motion, modify little bit, maybe you increase the PGA or you decrease the PGA or maybe on the duration or frequency length. Maximum motion levels such as peak acceleration, peak velocity have been used to rescale actual strong ground motion record to higher or lower levels of shaking. So, most of the time as we discussed that is either PGA or PGV increased or decreased. So, that is scaling up is done for the when you modify the actual ground motion record. Continue with this, this type of rescaling procedure requires careful selection of the actual motion that has to be used because here uh, what you are doing, you have selected a motion from somewhere and then you are scaling it up or up down rather than doing and uh, changing the frequency content most of the time. In that case, the selection of uh, this uh, actual ground motion that is important. A desirable ground motion record will not only have a peak acceleration or velocity which is close to the target value, but will have magnitude, distance and local side characteristic that are similar to those of the target motion. So, such a record is most likely to have a similar frequency content and duration to the target motion. So, whatever uh, target motion you have, so whatever record you select, so it will be likely to have a similar frequency content and duration because it has been carefully selected. Rescaling of the time scale has been used to modify the frequency content of an actual ground motion record. One way you do not change the time scale, you just uh, you know that uh, change the peak ground acceleration is scaling up and down. Another way you can keep the PGA and PGV constant, but you are uh, the time scale has been uh, rescaled. Once you are changing the time duration, then actually the frequency content will also change. And this is usually accomplished by modifying the time step of a digit digitized actual record by the ratio of the predominant period of the target motion to the predominant period of the actual motion. So, one side you have two predominant period, one is of the target motion, another is of actual record. So, you find the ratio of these two and then actual record is multiplied by this ratio to have this. Since this approach changes the frequency content or the entire spectrum as well as the duration of the rescale record it should be used carefully. Here you are changing two things, one is duration as well as frequency control. So, one of the example is given here. So, what has been done in this case? Uh, this uh, original axelogram from actual earthquake is given in figure A by rescaled version of actual uh, axelogram in which time was scaled was multi scaled upward by a factor of 1.3. So, here uh, this T has, you could see that most of the peak uh, uh, finish at here in this case, but they are running up to this point. So, the difference between this, this will be 1.3 times of this time here. and here also the peak value which was occurring here has shifted here. So, the difference between time, this time will be about 1.3 times of the time of the peak values here because you are multiplied by a factor of 1.3, 30 percent. So, to match target predominant period, the duration has been also increased by the same factor. 1.3. So, duration will also not be constant rather this will increase. So, continue with this modification of actual ground motion record to generate artificial ground motions of long duration without significantly changing the frequency content 
so for example, Seed and Idris in 1969, then splicing is done, parts of actual ground motion record together. So, you have actual ground motion record, but you divide into different sectors that record and you have one group splices and then another group or and processor for this type must be also questions because only you are changing some particular sector rather than and finally, we need to have a careful examination of the reasonableness of splice motion in both the time and frequency domain is advised. So, we will discuss what is in the next what is the time domain generation and then once we finish with time domain generation, then we will discuss the frequency domain generation. How using time domain analysis you can generate the time history which is used for the design purpose for the. So, first the resemblance of ground motion time histories to transient stochastic process was noted earlier long back by Hausner in even in 1947 that there is a similarness for that. Since then a number of processes that treat ground motions as stochastic that is random process have been developed. Many of these uh, operate entirely in the time domain, uh, many of these process work in the time domain only not in the frequency domain. So, continue with this a stationary stochastic process is the one whose statics remain constant with time. A stationary acceleration for example, would have a constant mean acceleration, constant standard deviation of acceleration and a constant frequency content. The acceleration would continue indefinitely. The fact that the acceleration amplitude of actual ground motion varies with time, it is not constant rather it will be varying with the time. Ground motions have a beginning and end, you will have a starting from where the your ground motions are starting some peaks are coming then it go to the peak values and then it decreases, but it will ultimately have some end also because ultimately it have some duration. So, within this duration you have some peaks, so it is not going to be infinite duration or like this. So, the acceleration amplitude of actual ground motion will be not constant rather it will vary and it must be vary because you will get somewhere peak values, but in the beginning you will not have any peak at the end also you will not have any peak. So, studies have also shown that the frequency content of a typical ground motion is also non stationary, it changes over the duration of shaking, there is not constant rather it will be changing over the duration of shaking. Generation of an artificial ground motion time history in the time domain typically involves multiplying a stationary filtered white noise signal, you have filtered white noise signal. <laughs> So, in this case you remove the unwanted and you have white noise signal filtered and it need to be to be, need to be multiplied by an envelope function that describes the built up and subsequent decay of ground motion amplitude. So, you have basically filtered white noise signal need to be multiplied by an envelope function. So, the product of these two that is one one part filtered white noise signal another is in envelope function will give the ground motion. And this envelope function should describe the built up and subsequent decay of ground motion amplitude. So, using these two uh, products these two we find the artificial ground motion. For example, here is the case here one example is given in time domain how you generate an artificial ground motion. So, the here in this case example of time uh, domain generation of synthetic time history or which is called synthetic time history we say synthetic time history or we say artificial time history they are the same thing. Time history of white noise is filtered in the time domain. So, this is white noise the point A and this is coming from the actual time history white noise. So, you take out white noise that means basically uh, you could see the peak values are more or less same. So, one window you have taken then in the figure B filtered uh, time history of filtered white noise filter. So, you have this time history of filtered white noise here you have time history and the this is filtered white noise. So, this is the filtered white noise in B case white noise 
in C case you have an envelope function, this is envelope function. So, what you do? You multiply by B and C and you find you multiply by B and C and then product of B and C will give you D and what is D here? Artificial ground motion. So, you find and this white noise is coming from here only from A. From A you first find the white noise and then envelope function, envelope function multiplied by the white noise that will help you to produce the artificial ground motion time stream which is shown in figure D. Now, the similar treatment which we do for uh, the time domain generation, there is a frequency domain generation also for the ground motion or the synthetic ground motion. Ground motion can be generated quite conveniently in the frequency domain by combining a Fourier amplitude spectrum with Fourier phase spectrum. So, you have two spectrum here, one is called Fourier amplitude spectrum. So, this is the first one Fourier amplitude spectrum and the second one is Fourier phase spectrum. The amplitude spectrum may be computed from an actual ground motion. How to compute these two spectrum? The first one can be computed by actual ground motion spectrum or may be represented by some theoretical means. Uh, so, we find first amplitude spectrum and the Fourier phase spectrum. So, the uh, so that, that can be found theoretical means the first one Fourier amplitude spectrum. While the phase spectrum may be obtained from an actual ground motion or may be computed from a time tree given by the product of white noise and envelope function as we discussed in the time domain. You have white noise and envelope function then using this you find out the product of these two that will help you to find out what we call the phase spectrum. Frequency domain methods are particularly useful for generating motions that are consistent with target response spectrum. You have that ultimately finally, you have target response spectrum. So, for the target response spectrum your frequency domain methods uh, are useful that they will be helpful to generate the target response spectrum. For example, here in the frequency domain generation how it is done. So, example of frequency domain generation of synthetic time history, what is A figure A time history of white noise is shaped by envelope function to produce time history of enveloped white noise. So, so, here you have the time history and using this you produce time history of enveloped white noise. So, this is here in the B you have enveloped white, white noise, enveloped white noise. That means, you have between the selected window you have some envelope and in this envelope. Now, you have FPS, what is FPS? Fourier peak spectrum, Fourier amplitude spectrum, Fourier phase spectrum. So, PS is here phase spectrum, spectrum while AS is both are Fourier, this is amplitude spectrum. So, now you have the spectrum and using this phase spectrum and this is combined with what we call the amplitude spectrum to produce synthetic time history. So, final answer is here in E, this is synthetic time history, synthetic or artificial time history. Continue with frequency domain generation, there are some computer algorithms are available for example, earthquake generation and response calculation requires uh, they assumes initial Fourier amplitude and phase spectra and then iteratively adjust the ordinates of the Fourier amplitude spectrum until a motion which is consistent with the target response spectrum is produced. So, the adjustment is done in the amplitude of the Fourier amplitude spectrum until you find out that there is a consistency between it is consistent with the target response spectrum. The origin of the target response spectrum must be kept in mind when generating the spectrum compatible motions. So, where they are has been calculated. Con there is cons constant risk spectra for example, represent the aggregate effect of potential earthquakes of many different magnitudes which occurs at many different distances. Because a constant risk spectrum does not correspond to any particular seismic event, a motion which is generated from a constant risk target spectrum 
should not be expected to correspond to, to a particular seismic event because it is not uh, generated using a particular seismic uh, event. So, naturally the it will not be uh, should be targeted to for a particular seismic event. Then you have the third what you call the Green's function technique using that also artificial time histories can be generated synthetic time history. The green function approach to ground motion modeling is based on the idea that the total motion of a particular site is equal to the sum of the motion which is produced by a series of individual ruptures of many small patches on the causative fault. So, you have it is done in what is done in this case green function you divide a number of patches and total motion will consist of some of the motions which is produced by series of individual ruptures of many patches. So, you divide a number of patches and find the motion for each the patches and then combine. Naturally, when you do this combination, this can be used only for the linear analysis rather than non-linear analysis. Obtaining the site motion requires defining the geometry of the earthquake source that what is the ge geometry of the earthquake source. Dividing the source into finite number of patches which is the hallmark for Green's function technique. During the uh, defining the sequence in which the patches rupture that is which one will rupture first which one will rupture second. Defining the slip functions that is functions describe the variation of slip displacement with time for each page across the source and defining Green's functions uh, the functions that describe the motion of the site due to an instantaneous unit slip of the source across the source. So, using this different like you know different steps you can use the Green's but hallmark of Green's function technique you are dividing whole into a uh, like problem into number of patches. For example, here one of the example here this in this slide you have n number of patches 1, 2, i h and n. So, this is shows the schematic of Green's function for a fault divided into n patches. So, n patches has been divided. Differences in the Green's function for the different patches are due to the difference in total focal depth, epicentral distance and geologic structure along the source site path. So, you have one site is you, you have the fault which is basically source and the, here is site. The distance between source and site in general could be okay, same, but because source itself is divided into number of patches then you need to calculate the distance from each each of the patch and then influence of this each of the patch on the site condition. So, epicenter once Green's functions have been determined site motions can easily be simulated for a variety of fault rupture patterns and slip functions. Combining the Green's function with the slip functions give the motion at the site due to slip of each individual patch. So, we find the motion first which is due to the slip of each individual pa uh, patch summing the effects of slips of each patch while accounting for the order in which they cap rupture produces the overall ground motion at the site. Obviously, the summation process assumes that all materials are remain linear. So, the naturally this summation can be done principle of sup uh, superposition will be applicable for linear material not for the nonlinear material that is one thing here. And here what we are doing the Green's functions with slip function. So, that will give the motion at the site due to slope of each individual patch. So, we find for each individual patch and then some of the response of the motion. Calculation of Green's functions requires knowledge of the velocity structure of the crustal materials between the source and site. So, what is the soil profile between the source and site that need to be known? Our estimation of velocity structure particularly with respect for the structuring that produces late arriving coda waves is very difficult problem. So, this estimation of the velocity profile structure is not easy like you need to conduct some test or maybe but particular distance is large area is quite wide, wide. So, it is also sometimes difficult. So, another way con con considerable computation of effort is also required to calculate Green's function finite element, finite difference and ray theory techniques are usually used for this purpose. So, you can do use the uh, in the Green's function technique or uh, like numerically rather than uh, the actual. 
The Green's function approach is particularly useful for generating near field motions. So, this technique is for applicable rather than far field motion. This is for near field motion. That is the motion at sites which are close enough to fault that fault dimensions become significant. For fire field test sites, the fault can be treated as point source without undue loss of accuracy. If you are the like uh, source is quite away, then we can consider it as a like a point source. The nature of the rupture pattern including the gen general direction in which rupture progresses and the size azimuth which is related to the fault can strongly influence ground motion in the near field. So, in the near field these there are different parameters which can influence the result. Actual ground motions are complicated, they are influenced by and consequently reflect the correction of the seismic source and the rupture process, the source to travel path and local site condition. So, you have you know that uh, different, so you have source site travel path and local site conditions. So, actual ground motion will be influenced by both source to site tra travel path what is comes between when the waves travel from source to site that is one part. Another at the same site uh, the effect of local site condition will also change. So, so that th therefore, actual ground motions because they are very complicated and generating artificial time history or synthetic time history is not easy. It may match, it may not match with the actual ground motion. Although it is convenient to characterize them with a small number of parameters, it is important to remember such characteristics can never be complete because it may represent the actual case or may not. Artificial motions that match a small number of target parameters are not unique because uh, the motions are not unique. For the same parameters, the many different motion can produce the same target parameters. So, our target parameter is same, but still the actual ground motions which can predict the same target parameters may be different. So, I can produce something else, uh, other person may produce something else and ultimately still they are leading to the same target parameters. So, it is possible. If a, such a set of motions are used to analyze problem for which damage correlates well to the target parameters, the predicted damage is likely to be cons consistent. So, what it can be done? Uh, in that uh, one of the target parameters could be the simulation of the damage which occurred during the past earthquake. For example, a set of different motions with this, the same peak acceleration will produce similar base shears in a stiff linear elastic structure which is founded on rock. If you have linear elastic structure, but structure is stiff and it is founded on rock. So, in that case because it is founded on rock the effect of SSI is not be going to be negligible. So, in this case a set of different motions with the same peak acceleration in that case will produce similar base shears. The same set of motion however, might produce a broad range of base shears in a flexible or inelastic structure or a structure founded on soft soil. Now, you have another scenario where you may have your structure is still situated on the rock but instead of you have the flexible or inelastic structure. In that case, uh, the broad range of base shears produced may be different. So, and another way you could have a structure which is founded on soft soil, soil conditions are not on the rock. You may have one side, so it will influence. Instead of rock, if you have soft soil that is going to influence. Instead of the Rigid structure, if you have the flexible structure, then also results are going to change. They could also produce significantly different estimates of permanent slope movement or liquefaction potential. When using artificial motion, the eventual use of the motions must always be reconciled with the criteria from which they were developed. So, the whatever the criteria using those these motions have been developed, that need to be also revisited. So, with this, uh, I conclude. Uh, the last lectures on the local site effects and we have the, this way we have finished the module number 3 and almost uh, 50 percent of the course is over exactly. Thank you very much for your kind attention.